Happy Monday. I'm recording this about 11.15 p.m. Eastern Time on Sunday night. As it sits right now, USC has a pretty commanding lead over Oregon. So, eventually, throughout the show here, we will discuss that. But there's a lot to discuss on today's show. Indiana hiring Mike Woodson as head coach, along with Dad Mata for some other role. Uh, We'll talk about that. The NIT championship was awarded on Sunday morning. Sweet 16 recap, of course, we'll talk about that. We will look forward to the Elite Eight, and uh, and we'll try and give out some picks. We're going to have our Monday live show in the afternoon, of course. Uh, but So we'll, we'll talk about our picks before that. Uh, UFC 260 recap, along with a ton of other stuff. Go ahead and remind you all, hit that subscribe button for us, whether it's on podcast or YouTube or whatever. Share the show out, tell your friends about it. WinningCuresEverything.com is the website. And... As always, you can find us over at sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF. Our college football gambling coverage is over there, along with just college football news. we got a ton of stuff to discuss. So why don't we go ahead and fire into the show. Are you kidding me? You are looking live. Winning cures everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. That's right, running Gary Solo show this evening, and I guess Monday morning is when you will be listening to it. I am, uh, I am exhausted. It has been a long basketball weekend, a long sports weekend, much to get into. I uh, already told you once, we'll tell you again, winningcureseverything.com is the website. You can follow the live show on Facebook, Periscope, Twitch, and on YouTube. I, I believe Periscope is going away. So I guess it's just going to be on Twitter. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Either way, make sure that you are subscribed. YouTube, probably the easiest way to do that. You can always get notified of when we are going live by hitting that little bell button. And it'll let you know whenever we post new videos, all that fun stuff. So make sure that you go ahead and check that out. And sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF. That is our uh, one-stop shop for all your college football gambling needs and whatnot. So let's dive into the news of the day, and that would be... I guess the biggest news of the day, Indiana basketball hires Mike Woodson, former NBA head coach, as uh, their new head coach. He has no college basketball coaching experience. I don't understand the move. I guess, so So here is what I am assuming, right? I am assuming that Indiana basketball, the boosters that are associated with it, paid to have Archie Miller fired, and they are tired of going through guys that have not been at Indiana, and Football programs have done this in the past, too. Michigan used to do it. You had to be a Michigan man. Alabama used to do it. Anybody that was around Gene Stallings or Bear Bryant, they were the first ones in line to get the job. That's not how it works nowadays. Mike Woodson, of course, Bobby Knight ties, all that good stuff. He played at IU, all these wonderful things. But he is a 62- or 63-year-old man with no college coaching experience. So, to alleviate that issue... They bring in former Ohio State coach and former Butler coach and a former Xavier coach as well, Dad Mata, who is not healthy enough to actually coach a team. But they brought him in as an associate athletic director for basketball, and he is going to help with the basketball program. He's going to help with the coaching. He's going to help with, I guess, the staff. I don't foresee how this is going to work, but I've been wrong about these before. Right, Chris and I were incredibly wrong about hiring Herm Edwards at Arizona State. The idea behind it seemed absolutely ridiculous. They were going to have a CEO mindset. They were going to build this as an organization, and Herm Edwards was going to be the guy, but they were going to have other guys in the background, somebody that serves as like a general manager. That Well, general managers have become fairly popular in college football nowadays. Somebody that runs the roster. Uh, Barton Simmons, former 247 sports recruiting analyst. He is now the general manager for Vanderbilt football under Clark Lee. There's a lot of different ways that this could end up working. But if they are doing this because Michigan has had success with Jawan Howard, who didn't have any college coaching um, uh, experience, if they're doing it because of Jawan Howard, this ain't that. This ain't the same thing. Juwan Howard did not have any college coaching experience, but he is 46 years old, and he is somebody that played with LeBron James that everybody knows. Mike Woodson is a failed NBA coach. He's an assistant for the Knicks. Like, this does not make sense on its surface. Could it work? 
feasibly, I guess, maybe. But do I expect it to? Absolutely not. <laughs> there's, there's so many things that could go wrong with this hire. Uh, they have to make sure that they nail the coaching staff. My first call would be Dana Fife. Dana Fife is an assistant coach at Michigan State. He's an Indiana guy, but he is known as an up-and-comer. He's a young, young dude. I, I think he would work insanely well, insanely well, as the assistant head coach, as the guy that can get recruits, that, can, that understands the Indiana way and all that. That would make a lot of sense if they go out and get him. As of right now, you know, 11.22 p.m. Eastern time on Sunday evening, uh, that ain't going to work. Like, that, that, it has not happened yet. So, who knows what they end up doing. Dad Mata, I think, is a, a good idea. But, I, I mean, at the same time, this is a guy that the last four years at Ohio State did not go well. And he hasn't been in coaching in a long time, partly because he's not healthy enough to do it. I mean, I guess he's healthy enough to sit up in an office. But I just, I, I don't understand the move. It doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Uh, if it were me, I would have waited a little bit and gone and, and shot my shot with Porter Mosier. But, again, Porter Mosier has had uh, failures in his past as well. I think he's learned from them. I think he's still young enough to be able to build a program at a Power 5 school. It would not shock me to see him end up taking DePaul just to get out of Loyola. Because at Loyola, you are still in a spot where, more times than not, you have to win your conference tournament just to get into the NCAA tournament. Maybe. Like, Drake got in this year as a play-in game. Like, they were one of the last four teams in. And they were 25-4. and four. Like, you're at a school where you have to win your conference tournament just to get to the dance. And, and that's, not, that's not a fun way to live. Because anything can happen in a single elimination tournament. So, is what it is on that. Uh, Indiana, I hope that it works. I really hope that it works. But, if it doesn't, it won't shock me in the least. Uh, moving on from there, let's uh, let's go ahead and discuss the NIT champions. Now, we've got the NCAA tournament going on. We're moving into the Elite Eight on Monday evening. There's a lot to dive into with that. But the Memphis Tigers went through a slate in in Dallas, Texas. in Well, Frisco, Texas, I guess is where it was. Um, or Denton, or somewhere. Somewhere in Texas. So, wherever it was. But Memphis rolled through their slate. They won on Saturday morning and then had to play again on Sunday morning to win the NIT tournament. And, uh, and they beat Mississippi State 77-64. to uh, Jumped out to a 13 to nothing lead in the first few minutes of the ball game. And then State found a way to come back, shot their way back into it, and tied the game at the half. And from there, Memphis just absolutely demolished uh, Mississippi State in the second half. I mean, th- this is a fantastic basketball team. They're going to be really experienced next year. Uh, I look for big things from Penny Hardaway. Now, I don't know what they're going to look like without Tony Madlock as an assistant coach, but I think this is an opportunity for Penny Hardaway to go and hire somebody the same way that Jawan Howard hired um, Phil Martelli. Like, go and get an experienced, older, former head coach to be your bench guy, help you with your X's and O's. I mean, that's, that's a big part of this. They got the defense thing down. And we understand defense is mostly about want to. I think that's the biggest thing here. On offense, they they have to learn to play together. Like their offense is just a disaster. If they're not hitting shots, they don't know how to how to work the ball around to be able to get a good look. It's just a bunch of guys playing AAU ball right now. But they can fix that. There are ways to fix an offense. So I hope that bigger things are on the horizon. People might be surprised, but Memphis, as of right now, uh, or at least this morning, they were number 32 at Ken Palm. That means they would have been a favorite over Elite Eight team Oregon State. That is crazy to think about. And they could not get into the tournament because they did not have an NCAA tournament resume. But they did go through and handle business in the NIT. That is a a sign of things going in the right direction, I believe. So congrats to the Memphis Tigers on a big NIT win. A lot of people say that that stuff doesn't matter. It is proven time and time again that the teams that are successful in the NIT typically end up making the NCAA tournament the next year. So, hopefully, for those Tigers, big things are on the horizon. Moving on from there, let's talk about the Sweet 16. And goodness gracious, uh, what a what a fantastic set of games we have had. Now, there have been some blowouts, but there have been some that have been incredibly intriguing. We will, we will just say that. We'll start off with the first game on Saturday, Oregon State 65, Loyola 58. 
Uh, Loyola started the game 4 of 24, dug themselves a hole they could not get out of. They picked the worst possible time to have their worst offensive game. It's just awful. Uh, Oregon State's Ethan Thompson uh, goes off again. He has 22 points, 4 assists, 4 rebounds. He he has kind of done this in their 6-game winning streak. But I will say this. Oregon State, the odds of them winning the three games in a row that they have with the shot selection that they have had, and we can you can find this over uh, at shotquality.com or just find them on Twitter, at shotquality. Incredibly interesting analytics here. Uh, the chances of them winning the last three games all in a row is less than 1%. Like, they are a paper tiger right now. There's no way that they should be winning the games that they are winning with the shots that they are taking, and yet the shots are falling, and they are not at all for the other teams. On this six-game winning streak, the teams that they are playing are shooting. Only one of them has shot over 30% from three. The next closest was 27.6%, and then after that, nobody has hit 25%. That's insane. That's just not likely in a six-game winning streak, and yet here they are. This is what makes March Madness so much fun, right? The unexpected typically always finds a way to happen somewhere. So Oregon State, as a 12 seed, is now in the Elite Eight, and that is a lot of fun. Uh, Moving on from there, uh, we are going to talk about the second game on Saturday, and that was the Baylor Bears. The Baylor Bears went down 30-23 to at the half to Villanova and came back and just stomped them in the second half, 39-21. to Uh, Both teams only had two players that hit double digits. This was a little bland, a little boring to watch. Baylor could not hit anything from outside, and yet they find a way to to pull off the W. Um, I think Baylor... Outside of Gonzaga, Baylor is the second best team left in this bracket, at the left in this field. Uh, they're going to have a tough game with Arkansas. It, the stats would tell you that they should be able to handle Arkansas fairly easily. I mean, we're talking close to double digits. At least they should. Now, Arkansas's got athletes, and, and they play a little bit chaotically so they can take you out of your game. Uh, if Baylor does not allow that to happen, they should be able to handle that game. But we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about that once we go forward. Uh, Arkansas. Arkansas got there. It was not easy at all. 72 to 70 over Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts led at the half, 35 to 28. Um, Max Abmus uh, missed a three pointer at the buzzer that would have given them the win, and it was a smooth look. I mean, they they played it perfectly, got the exact look that they wanted, and it was just off the mark by a hair. And sometimes that's all you need. Uh, Arkansas shot one of nine from three in this game. Moses Moody was 4 of 20. I don't know how many more times you're going to be able to get Moses Moody to go 4 for 20 from the field. But Oral Roberts had a shot, you know, and that's all you can ask for as a 15 seed. Uh, I don't believe any 15 seed has ever uh, gone past the round of 16, and they were as close as you could get. This was a hell of a performance by Paul Mills and that bunch. Uh, Mills, I think, should be getting a look at that Oklahoma job. But, alas, it is what it is. Uh, moving on from there, we will recap with Houston. Uh, they just put an absolute beating on Syracuse on Saturday night, 62-46. to 46. Uh, It was the lowest points scored in school history for Syracuse. Uh, they shot 5 of 23 from three-point range, and I told you guys last week, I said, look, Houston is really good at defending three ball. And, and sometimes that helps, sometimes it doesn't. Like, if, if you're going to hit shots with a hand in your face, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit, then there's nothing that the defense can do. But the defense, especially for Houston, very good at running teams off the three-point line. They can get them out of their game. And Syracuse, once once Buddy Boeheim was not able to hit shots from outside, they didn't have anything to fall back on. Houston, luckily, had had some experience against that 2-3 matchup zone, and they were able to attack it. They were able to get looks inside and whatnot, and, and they did not fall a lot early. But... As time wore on, they were still able to attack. And once Syracuse was not able to hit shots, it got them out of their game. It got them out of their defense. And Houston ended up winning this one by 16. I don't think it's uh, it's not surprising to me at all. Uh, Houston out-rebounded them 40-31. to 31, And that's not shocking. Like Houston typically outplays or, or what, what's the word? They out-want to other teams a lot. They're just tougher. And that, that's the sign of a Kelvin Sampson team. So, it's fun to see Kelvin Sampson back into the Elite Eight. Uh, The next however many games, 
Uh, not a lot to discuss. I guess the next couple. Gonzaga, 83. Creighton, 65. That's about what we expected. I, I mean, what else was there to, to even discuss with it, really? Uh, Gonzaga is the significantly better team, and they showed it in this game. Creighton was gonzaga light. They do a lot of the exact same things that Gonzaga does, only Gonzaga is better. They have better players at every position. They do everything that Creighton wants to do, only they do it better. That's the easiest way you can put it. At every possible stat that you can look at, they were better than Creighton. So, you know, it maybe it was a little a little close early, but that that's unless you get a jump out on on Gonzaga, there's just no no prayer. So, uh, maybe you could be surprised that they kept it within 20, I guess. But uh, but an 18-point win, you know, it is what it is. Uh, moving on from there, another blowout. Michigan 76, Florida State 58. This was not even close. This was the best performance of the tournament by the Wolverines. And maybe their best performance since Isaiah Livers went out. And Dana Jacobson confirmed with Jawan Howard before this game that Isaiah Livers is out for the NCAA tournament. He is... He is done, and, you know, I am excited to see them in the Elite Eight, for sure, because I think they have finally figured these things out. Like, I fig- they figured out how to play without Livers. Livers is a senior. He has been on this team forever. They, they run a lot of things through him, and when they first lost him, they did not know what to do without him. They had no idea. And, you know, okay, like, I, we we all, they were the trendiest upset pick of a one seed in this entire bracket. And yet, here they are. They're still playing. And they are the only Big Ten team left. And I don't know if that's surprising or not. You know, it, it's, it's, really, it's really strange to see, uh, especially against a Florida State team with as much length as they have. Uh, but the guards played well for Michigan. And Chris called this one. I mean, he absolutely called it. He was dead on about it. Um... You know, I, I don't know. I don't know where else to go with it. I mean, Chris was was all over it. Chris was all over this one. Uh, finally, we will move on to the game right before the Oregon USC game. UCLA eighty eight, Alabama seventy eight, and the Pac twelve just continues to roll. They are eleven and one in this tournament, and now they're they're going to be twelve and two because whoever wins USC or Oregon, it won't matter. Those are both Pac twelve teams, and from what I understand, it's the first. Uh, the first Pac-12 matchup in the NCAA tournament ever, which is a little surprising. But either way, USC is up right now, 69-58. to uh, Oregon is on a 9-0 run with 6-10 left in the game, and we'll, we'll talk about that here momentarily. But UCLA 88, Alabama 78, that was something else. Uh, the shot from Alex Reese to send it into overtime was shocking, was just an extension of misery. I mean, Alabama was... About as putrid in this game as you could possibly get. Uh, 11 of 25 from the free throw line. They were 7 of 28 from three-point range. They were 30 of 69, only 43.5% from the field in this game. Now, they did out-rebound UCLA, but UCLA, 10 of 29 from three. That's almost 35%. Uh, They were 20 of 25 from the free throw line. That's 80%. Uh, they, They shot the ball incredibly well. Johnny Juzang did not play well. He went out with about three minutes, two minutes left in this ballgame, whatever it was, and it didn't matter. UCLA was still able to hit shots. They had uh, uh, ja- Jaquez, Jaquez, Jaquez. Uh, that kid hit at least two shots with time running down, looking for fouls, trying just whatever, and, and both of them went in. Just unbelievable, crazy, you know, crap that only happens in March. And sometimes you need that. You know, Alabama, had they found a way to actually hit free throws, they would have won this game easily. It would not have been close. And instead, UCLA goes 20 for 25 from the free throw line, and Alabama goes 11 for 25, and it is what it is. Uh, it, it was a little bit shocking. Uh, Jaden Shackelford, who Alabama has really counted on to be a scorer for them, only had four points. He was two of seven from the field, 0 of two from three-point range, which was nuts because he typically fires them. Uh, Herb Jones, two of seven from the free throw line. And the team actually seemed to play better without Herb Jones in the lineup, which is crazy because he is the senior leader. He's the defensive player of the year, 
all these things. But when he went out early with two charge calls on him, which was nuts, and two charges in the first, like, 41 seconds of the game, and he went to the bench with two fouls. But once he went to the bench with two fouls, Alabama went on a 13 to nothing run. They, they seemed to find more spacing on the floor. Um, I mean, Herb was – he was playing hurt, it looked like, for part of this game. Uh, Alex Reese – only took two shots in the entire game. The first shot that he took was that half-court three-pointer that sent the game to overtime. That's insane. Alex Reese has been a big part of this offense. Uh, Josh Primo, 0 of 4 from 3. Like, it just insane. Alabama did not play well. And honestly, that first half for UCLA uh, basically won them the ball game. Uh, Johnny Juzang was not great, but if you look at Bernard, uh, Bernard was 4 of 10 from 3. But he was 4 of 5 in the first half. That gave them a 40-29 to 29 lead. Alabama had to fight to get back just to tie the game early in the second half. And after that, UCLA kind of took over. They, they made them play. They made Alabama play the way that they wanted to. They slowed this thing down. It was 65-65 to 65, uh, at the beginning of overtime. And they outscored Alabama 23-13 to 13 in overtime. In the overtime is five minutes, okay? In the 20 minutes in the second half that UCLA and Alabama played, UCLA scored 25 points in 20 minutes. In five minutes in overtime, now I understand a lot of these were fouls and whatnot, but they did hit a ton of crazy shots in overtime uh, to get a lead early. They were 23, uh, they scored 23 points in the five minute overtime period. That's insane. Like, I don't know that I've ever seen that. So it's pretty nuts. Um, but I am excited for Mick Cronin. He is who I wanted Alabama to hire before they hired Nate Oates. And Cronin was always good at Cincinnati, but could never get to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. He did it one time in his second season after uh, the Andy Kennedy interim situation, right after Huggins left and all that. Um, but it, Cronin, I thought, was a fantastic coach. His style is what I would assume would typically win in the NCAA tournament, they just were not able to get to the Sweet 16 after that second season. He goes to UCLA. He is now in the Elite Eight and only his second year there. Uh, this is an incredibly talented roster. Incredibly talented. I don't know that they're going to be able to hang with Michigan. I don't think that matters at this point. They have exceeded expectations beyond anybody's wildest dreams. A lot of people did not even think they were going to get into this tournament, and yet here they are. Right? They have won four straight games. They won the play-in game in overtime against Michigan State. Uh, they ended up beating BYU. They beat Abilene Christian in the round of 32, and then they go and beat Alabama, the two seed, the uh, the number five overall seed in this tournament, and make them play the way that Alabama did not want to play. I will say that. So, cheers to Mick Cronin. Hell of a ball game. Hell of a night for sure on that one. Uh, as it sits right now, uh, we'll double check the score on this Oregon USC game because it looked like it was about to be a uh, a USC route. Uh, 72 to 60 with 320 left. We're we'll talk more about this on uh, on Monday's live show. Um, it appears that USC just kind of had their way with Oregon, and part of that is Oregon is shooting five of 20 from three and only 23 of 64 from the field. That is 35.9 percent. Um, on the other end, USC 10 of 17 from three. That's 58.8 percent. That'll do it. That'll knock this thing out. So. You know, is what it is. Moving on, let's look at the Elite Eight and what we've got right now. I'm not going to give picks just yet. We will do that on the Monday live show. Uh, but starting off Monday, 6.15 p.m. Central Time on CBS, 12-seed Oregon State against 2-seed Houston. The line is sitting around 8 right now. Again, I told you the chances that Oregon State won the last three games all in a row based on the shot selection that they had, the shot quality, uh, was less than 1%. It's insane. This is this is paper tiger. This is, I don't buy this at all. If they win this game, it is what it is, but it won't be because of anything that any handicap or anybody else told you. It's just a gut feel. It's whatever. If you just look at the numbers, look at the way that this thing is going, Houston should win this game. It should not be close. And here we are, you know. Uh, their six-game winning streak is just ridiculous. Like, I, I gave you all the numbers before. But I'm I'm still looking at them again. I mean, they, the three pointers that Oregon State has hit, uh, they hit ten, they hit ten, they hit nine, they hit ten in the four game winning streak, and then in the last two, they hit six and they hit five from three. 
And a lot of it came down to the other team just not being able to knock down shots. It, it wasn't, and I watched the Loyola game. This was not because Oregon State had their hand in their face all the time. Um, you know, Oregon State has been hot from outside. Uh, Houston is number nine against the three in the country. After that Syracuse game, they were 12 going in. They shut down Syracuse so badly, it moved them all the way up to number nine in the country. That's that's how big of an impact they had. Uh, I would expect Houston to be able to cover seven and a half or eight, whatever the line is. So I'm going, I've already made my bet on that. I took it at seven and a half. A lot of places are at eight now, but I would still take it. I think Houston wins this by double digits. I don't think it's close. Baylor and Arkansas moving into that game. One, I'm pumped for Eric Musselman. Like it, seeing him win, that guy celebrates like nobody else in the country. It's incredible to watch. Uh, on the other side, Scott Drew, a uh, chance to make his first Final Four. The first Final Four for Baylor since 1950 when Bill Henderson was coaching the Bears. Uh, shout out to Gary Parrish and Matt Norlander for that, for the Ion College Basketball Podcast. But uh, but Baylor, uh, first shot at a Final Four in 71 years? That's insane. That's nuts. And I think they're going to get there. Baylor, number two in the country from three. Um, Arkansas is number 138 in the country in three-point defensive efficiency. That ain't a good matchup, especially after Baylor did not have a good shooting day against Villanova. And then second, Arkansas is number nine in defensive efficiency, but Baylor is number two in offensive efficiency. Baylor is still really good on defense as well. When they want to shut you down, they can. Arkansas likes to play chaotically. I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters at all. I think that Baylor can make a team play the way that they want them to play, and I fully expect going forward uh, that Baylor's going to handle them easily. Uh, the line as it sits right now, Baylor minus seven and a half. I would take it. I would take both favorites here. I, I would take Houston and Baylor, and we will have a one seed and a two seed reach the Final Four. We'll talk about the Tuesday matchups a little more on Monday's live show, and we'll talk more about these as well. But uh, but yeah, that is. That's something else to look forward to. I'll, I'll say that. We, we are going to have some fun basketball games over the next two nights. We will close off the show discussing UFC 260. Now, what an awesome night it was. We had to deal with some incredible thunderstorms, tornadoes touching ground uh, all over, like around us. Chris was supposed to come over to watch the fight. We had tornado warnings and whatnot. He didn't get to come over and watch it, so I ended up watching it by myself at the house. All of my buddies had to cancel, and I don't blame them. I would have done the same thing because we had no idea what to expect from these storms. It was pretty nuts. Chris was losing power. I never lost power, luckily. But uh, but let's talk about what actually happened in this. We'll start off with the the biggest fight, and that was Francis Ngannou destroying Stipe Miocic, or Miocic, whatever, however you say it. Um, knocked him out in the second round. Hit him so hard with the left jab, and when he came back, he had already rocked him a few times. But he hit him so hard with that left jab that he he bent over and folded. Like his knees buckled. Just every, I mean, he completely lost it. And Herb Dean, the referee, could not get over there fast enough, and Nganu gave him another, another one right on the chin, just a hammer fist. That looked brutal. It looked like it was going to bash his skull in. It was awful. Um but at, at the same time, the fight had not been called, and Ganu has to, he's got to do that. So, it is what it is. But it, it brings up a lot of questions, right? Um, what is Stipe going to do next? You know, I, I don't know what you do in that situation. Um, I, I mean, he's, he's the greatest heavyweight of all time, I think. Like, if you go and look at who he's beaten and, and how many title defenses and all this different stuff, there's a lot of different ways that you could say that he's the greatest heavyweight of all time. I don't know who, that he's the most famous heavyweight of all time. Like, that's still probably Brock Lesnar. or Daniel Cormier wasn't even a heavyweight for that long. He just came up just to fight, uh, fight Stipe. So, I don't know which direction you go with that, but I do think... That you maybe you have to give Stipe one more fight against Ngannou. I mean, he did beat him before. I mean, this is kind of the McGregor and Dustin Poirier thing, right? I don't know what the best fight is here. I will. I will say this. We'll we'll move on to this. This is the other question, and that is, uh, what is next for Francis Ngannou? His big thing has always been he does not want to hold up the division, right? Because he just had it happen to him for a year. He was waiting for 
Stipe and Daniel Cormier and all this other stuff. He's been waiting for his chance because he handled everybody else, right? Nganu got got beat by Stipe a while ago, and then he ran through the division and destroyed everybody. So what's left? It, it's kind of what happened with Habib. What do you do after you've climbed the mountain? Who else is there? Who is coming up that could be a worthy opponent that you haven't already beaten? Like, do you just go through them all again? And and how is that really fair to to do that? But he he's has, he's already said he's not going to hold up the division. So whatever Dana ends up wanting to do, Dana White, then Ngannou is going to do it. But after the fight, Ngannou said he wants to fight Bones Jones. John Bones Jones has been angling for this fight. He sent out a bunch of tweets during the fight and after the fight. He's been putting on weight. He's been hinting at a move up to heavyweight for a long time. He is the second biggest draw in this sport, maybe third, probably second, behind Conor McGregor. And then there's Jorge Masvidal in there in the middle as well. But that's a a more recent thing. Bones Jones has been doing this for years. Everybody tunes in to watch his pay-per-views. He's an incredibly uh, entertaining fighter. I would go with Bones Jones against Ngannou. I don't think it would be fair. I think Ngannou would kill him. But that is what everybody wants to see. So I really, really hope that Dana White does not find a way to screw this up. Give Bones Jones the money. Give him the money and make this fight. It's very easy to do. But you never know what's going to happen here. Uh, He could end up forcing a trilogy fight with Stipe. After this one, I don't know the I don't know what else there is to say. Like it, there was no point in this fight that it looked like Stipe had any control over this fight. He, he got to the second round. I understand that, but there was no point where you would believe that Stipe was going to win the fight. At no point, it, Ngannou was the calmer, better fighter the entire night, and and he rocked him absolutely rocked him. I don't know that we need to see a third one. And I think Stipe's probably, I mean, if I were him, I would retire at this point. He's an older guy. Uh, Unless you want to come back and just give it one more go for the belt, then maybe we'll do that. But I don't know how many people buy the pay-per-view. I really don't. I don't know what else there is that you need to see out of this. Nganu got beat by Stipe a couple years ago, however many, three years ago, whatever it was. You you could see Nganu has gotten better. I don't know that Stipe has. Uh, Stipe, I think, has done everything that he can do in this division. I, maybe it's maybe it's time to ride off into the sunset, but we shall see. Uh, some of the other fights that were on the card, really entertaining. Vincente Luque submits Tyron Woodley, and I think it's probably time for Woodley to retire. Uh, that's four straight losses. He is done with his contract with the UFC. Maybe he goes to Bellator, collects a few paychecks, whatever. Maybe he goes somewhere else. I don't know what else he would do, but he has not looked good in his last however many fights. Now, he has fought some great guys, right? We all understand that the people that he's fighting are the best in the world at what they do, but he was the best at what he did for a long time, and now as he's getting older, that's not good. Like, Luque was was ranked number 13 in their division. That's that's not great. Now, he's, he's an up-and-comer. He's won several in a row. He looks like he's a contender, but this is bad when you lose the way that he did. I mean, being submitted in the first round, it was a wild fight. It was crazy, but it ended quickly, and Woodley had no answer for him. Absolutely no answer. He got caught, and it was not good. Uh, Luke on the other side, like, yeah, you going to call out people, you better be careful who you're calling out. He called out Nate Diaz, and there's a lot of people that, that would call out Nate Diaz, right? Nate Diaz is a payday. Uh, he's an incredibly popular fighter. But I don't, you know, Luque has looked great here lately. I would love to see this fight. I don't know that it's going to happen. I don't know that Nate Diaz wants to, like, he can kind of pick and choose what he wants to do right now. He's kind of told Dana and them to shove it. You know, unless he gets the fights that he wants, he's not just going to jump in there for anybody. And I don't know that Luque excites him enough. But maybe maybe he saw something in this fight and in the last however many fights from Luque that, uh, that he would be interested in doing it. But I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, and finally, we will close on this one. Sugar Sean, O'Malley knocked out Almeida. Almeida, however you say it. Uh, He rocked that dude. And I don't know what the next course of action would be for Sugar Sean. 
uh, he he jumped back off of, uh, you know, off of a a massive loss to Vera. And after this, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, Dominic Cruz says that he wants him, uh, or at least that's according to Chael Sonnen. I I mean, this was a masterpiece. This was an absolute masterpiece. Sean O'Malley is great, um, but I I don't know what you do with him next, right? Like, let's see. I'm going to look up the UFC bantamweight uh, rankings, and then we'll see what they end up doing. Uh, Sterling, Peter Yan, Corey Sandhagen. Uh, Sugar Sean is not to that point yet. He's not up there with those guys. I think you need to get him some more big-name fights before you can put him in there. Cody Garbrandt. Um, let's see. Jose Aldo. I'm going to guess Aldo's probably gone. Maybe you give him another chance at uh, Marlon Vera. Uh, who knocked him out last time? Maybe, I guess. Uh, Marlon Vera's lost two of his last three. The only one he did win was against Sean O'Malley. Uh, but you've got you've got several different options here. Dominic Cruz is one. Jose Aldo, Marlon Moraes, um, Cody Garbrandt, Frankie Edgar, and then Corey Sandhagen is fighting against TJ Dillashaw uh, in May. So that would be, I think, uh, the next. You know, the next big thing, Cardi, uh, Cody Garbrandt is fighting Rob Font in May as well. You know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm uh, I'm excited about the prospects of another big-time Sean O'Malley fight, though. I will certainly tell you that. I'm excited about the direction the UFC is going right now. I have not been for most of 2020. Uh, by the way, USC finally put the clamps down on Oregon. Game is over, 82-68. to USC and Gonzaga will be the last Elite Eight game, and I'm pumped about that. Pumped about that. So, back to UFC, though. Uh, we've got a lot of big-time stuff coming up. In April, Usman against Masvidal 2 is happening, and that's going to be in Jacksonville. 15,000 fans. They sold that thing out in less than a day. Very impressive. And that's going to be a massive, massive card. Lots of title fights on there. So, we've got a lot to talk about with UFC coming up. Uh, you know, we, we've got, we still got football going on. we still got football news. we got NFL. we got the NFL draft coming up. we got all sorts of stuff happening. But, um... Uh, and we still got the NCAA tournament, of course. Lots to break down with that. We're going to have a lot more to talk about on the Monday Live show. You guys have been absolutely fantastic. I certainly appreciate all of you for tuning in for the solo shows. Typically, the way this is going to work, in case we have not explained it, I will be doing the Sunday night slash Monday morning shows, and then we will do our Monday Live show. The podcast will be released on Tuesday morning. And then Chris will do a Tuesday night slash Wednesday morning show, then we'll do a Wednesday live show that will be uh, released for podcast on Thursday. And then Chris and I both, or in some cases only one of us, will do a Thursday night slash Friday morning show. So you will have a new podcast in your feed every morning, Monday through Friday. And I think that's going to help things out. I think it's going to give you plenty of content that you would like to hear from. Uh, you're going to hear from both of us a lot together. And then we will also be doing our solo shows so that we can get a little more used to this. Chris has started doing a really good job with it. I've gotten out of the habit, but I do appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to work on it and actually listening and whatnot. We would love to hear your feedback. Jump into the comments on YouTube. Email us, tweet us, whatever. I'm at GaryWCE. Chris is at ChrisBGiannini. Or you can email either of us. I'm Gary at winningcureseverything.com. You can always send emails. You can always send tweets, all that good stuff. We would certainly like to hear from you. And, of course, the comments right here on YouTube. If you would... Do us a favor. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Go ahead and like the video. Share the show out. Tell your friends about it. And uh, and make sure that you go ahead and check out winningcureseverything.com. I've got that thing looking a little spiffy, I guess, uh, if I do say so myself. I've been working on it quite a bit. And we're going to add a lot more as we go through the football offseason. So go ahead and check that thing out. And, of course, our college football content, sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF. That is your stop to check everything out. Over there, we do a football show every week for Sportsbook Review. You can subscribe on YouTube. Just search out SBR Picks, and that will be what you need to subscribe to. We're over 84,000 subscribers over there. We need to get Winning Cures Everything up to that. We're we're sitting at like almost 3,900 subscribers on Winning Cures Everything's YouTube. Share it out. Tell all your friends about it. We would like to get more people involved in this community. We like to have fun. Sports is never ending. There's always something we're talking about, and we will continue to do so uh, until the cows come home. We'll just say that. All right. You guys, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and hopefully all of your tickets cash this week. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. 
If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com, or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.